Hello, I'm Matthias Lundberg, a senior economist at the World Bank, and I specialize in youth development issues. And I'm joined today by Bill Rees, president of the International Youth Foundation. We're here today for the first event in our Jobs Knowledge Platform Facebook discussion series. The Jobs Knowledge Platform is an initiative between the World Bank and a few other agencies to bring together knowledge and experience and to talk about how to create jobs and reduce unemployment and solve some of the problems facing young people around the world. And both Bill and I work especially on, on uh, the problems of young people and the issues of getting young people into work. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Let me start off by giving you a sense of the scale of the problem. Today, there are about 2 billion young people between the ages of 15 and 34 in the world. That's about a quarter of the world's population. But young people make up about half of the world's unemployed. And if you count those who are underemployed or vulnerable or who have left the labor force altogether because they're discouraged, the number is much higher. And the need for jobs keeps getting bigger. About a million young people enter the labor force in sub-Saharan Africa each month. Bill, can I ask you to say something about the work of the IYF and how you work with young people and help them take part in the economic growth and life of their countries and their society? Certainly. The International Youth Foundation is 22 years old, so I guess we're a young adult also. Uh, we work in about 70 countries in partnership with local philanthropies and well vetted and sustainable civil society organizations owned at that country and community level. And our major focus is how to make young people be successful adults, in many ways tracking with the World Development Report that the World Bank put out in 2007, uh, development and the next generation. We feel that the economic side is just crucial, that young people have to, the, the success of a, of a youth development program would be that society nets a healthy, civically engaged and employed adult. Thank you. Okay, so for the next 30 minutes or so, we will try to answer your questions about youth unemployment. Now, many of you have already submitted questions on Facebook and on Twitter and through the Jobs Knowledge Platform website. Uh, but please feel free to continue to send questions uh, for us to answer. We'll get to as many as we can. And those we can't answer now in the next 30 minutes, we'll try to answer, uh, pr provide answers on the web uh, after, the, after we finish today. So the first question, uh, comes from Robert in the UK, and he asks about uh, whether it's time for the business world, for the private sector, to shift its focus from shareholder value to social value. It's a great question, uh, and if I've learned anything in 40 years in working in development, it's to be, though, practical and realistic. I don't think that's going to happen in a massive way. Uh, businesses will always be looking to be profitable and to reward their owners and stockholders. Uh, but there's a growing body of knowledge and in literature on this in recent years, Michael Porter and others started uh, call, talking about shared value. And that shared value really means that a company can be doing good business for itself and its shareholders while also being a sharing partner, uh, contributing to the community, looking at all the environmental labor and human issues that, that take place. And I think you won't see such a shift as you'll see uh, good businesses looking at the entirety, the triple bottom line, if you will, of, of their business, where they source, where they hire, where they sell. Uh, it seems that there's a, a move towards uh, what's called social entrepreneurship. But, hey, does the IYF engage in, in developing that kind of capacity also? We do. Um, quite frankly, I think we want, at the end of the day, all young people to be entrepreneurial uh, in their social civic and, and business lives. Uh, because to me, an entrepreneurial person is someone who is imaginative, creative, thinks out of the box, is willing to take some risks, and those end up being the best employees as well as good entrepreneurs. But most of us don't start businesses. Yet I, I, my top criteria when I'm hiring people is to look for creative people who will be entrepreneurial within our nonprofit. I think governments and large businesses want to hire should be wanting to hire entrepreneurial people. How do we teach entrepreneurship? And so in social entrepreneurship, I think, can be interpreted in many different ways in, in your civic lives, in a social enterprise, in a nonprofit piece of work, uh, or uh, entrepreneurship in, in the real business for profit bottom line world, but that has a social conscience. So okay, thanks. Following on from that, uh, Anthony from Kenya asks, uh, what role do you think that public-private partnerships 
can have in ensuring that youth are, are absorbed into the jobs market? And are there specific instances uh, in your experience that have worked well in, in combining the, the interests of the public and private sectors? Well, I'd love to answer that, but uh, Matthias, we're good friends and yeah. we've worked a lot together, so I want to be hearing from you too oh, in all okay. this, and you know Fair a lot enough. about yeah. public-private partnerships. Yeah. But uh, they're not new, um, and yet I think in the last 10, 15 years, there's been a, a, a conscientious look at how to scale up and, and improve public-private partnerships the way that governments, nonprofits, and for-profits would work together locally, nationally, globally. Uh, because, in, in fact, those are the three sectors of society uh, that when they work well together, doing what each does particularly characteristically on its own, and then how they cooperate really tends to be a good, sound community, one that's growing and is civically engaged and has a lot of social capital, as we like to say. Those three sectors tend to get along and try to work with each other. Where they don't, or when one is terribly weak, a fragile state, uh, a stagnant economy, or a civil society that just isn't organized or permitted to, 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 to live and be active, uh, generally those communities and nations aren't functioning very well. Yeah. And uh, to answer your question, uh, I think that where we have employment programs or, or youth development programs that have worked the best, it's where we have had closer ties to the demand side of the labor market, yeah. that we understand yeah. what skills are in demand in the local labor market and we try to provide the skills, provide, provide trained young people to fill those, fill those jobs. And where they haven't worked best, where it worked terribly well, is where we just think only on the supply of skills right. without, without engaging with the local demand. We, we found that too, and we talk about a dual customer approach. One customer is the young person who wants a livelihood, a job, and a career, and, and a future. And the other customer is the, the organization, public, private, nonprofit, that's going to hire that person and keep them on. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, we have a number of questions uh, that are roughly the same, and I'll try to, to group them together. We've, these questions come from Rebecca in Mexico and Percy in South Africa uh, and Kenrick in Jamaica, and it has to do with, with strategies to get university graduates into jobs. These, these three young people are all, are all wondering about this. Best practices to get young people into jobs after college or to address the constraints facing young people after college. Well, it's huge, and uh, some countries, actually, Egypt is one, have a higher percentage of college graduates who are unemployed than high school graduates, which, is a, which are unemployed. And that's, at first, staggering and almost counterintuitive. Uh, but if it's happening, and it is, uh, it's a huge uh, mismatch of skills and money and training that's gone into getting those kids through college, and then think of the social, human, psychological frustration mm. on the individual, let alone on families in the community, of having put that young person through college and all that expense and time and, and hope and uh, there's no job. One thing we've done, our foundation, is working with Egyptian universities in creating career counseling centers. And there's no magic bullet to that, but a university doesn't have anything that resembles a career counseling center, mm. isn't doing the job. Uh, it's not the only answer to it, but we have helped using some experiences in other countries to create counseling centers uh, at these large Egyptian universities that actually teach a young person how to interview, how to write a resume, uh, how to conduct an interview, um, how to source the, the, the resume around and, and how to do some networking and that sort of thing that would up the chances of that person finding the, finding the, the openings and, and, and making a good case for him or herself. I know that in employer surveys in Egypt and, in, uh, and elsewhere, particularly in the MENA region, uh, employers are often told, are oft, often asked about, uh, about whom they hire and what, the, what skills they're looking for, and they say, well, we can't find the people with the right skills. Even though there are lots of university graduates and people who have good technical skills, mm -hmm. they don't have the right skills, the sort of soft skills or life skills mm -hmm. or, or uh, the skills to work in teams or succeed in a, in a modern business that, uh, that employers are, in, are demanding. Well, I think the skills match as some people call it, whether you're coming out of the university or coming out of high school or you're, uh, you've gone to six or seven years of schooling, but what skill set does a person come out of an incomplete secondary education, some vocational training uh, and or college uh, university training, what's the skill set though that the market really needs? Yeah. 
And those are technical skills, certainly. Uh, and technical could be all over the place, from a PhD in nuclear science to uh, a sixth grade uh, graduate who is semi-literate, but you're hoping to teach some IT skills so that they can work in the 21st century job market. Uh, but what are the soft skills that you mentioned, Matthias? And uh, soft skills or employability skills or life skills that have kind of come into our vocabulary in the last 10 or 15 years. And I think the fact that they've come in and you can say soft skills or employability skills in any part of the world today and people get it mm. means they, they're understanding the policymakers and the and the employers that it's it's oftentimes that skill or, or value or behavior to show up on time be there every day dress appropriately uh, handle yourself appropriately in a work situation um, Take orders, maybe sometimes give orders, work in a team, communicate, solve problems across gender, age, uh, and other uh, differences that you might a worker might find in, 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 a, in a workplace. Uh, we shouldn't take for granted that young people know what it is to work when they've never worked. So have they had any internships? And what we're finding, too, is that some cultures, some systems, uh, promote internships or apprenticeships pretty well and others do not and uh, those are places that really people learn by doing and we think that that's a good part of complement to formal education. This uh, leads to another question here I'm going out of order from what I had planned but it sort of nicely flows into a question from uh, from Spain from Marcel from Spain and he says one of the worst sides of youth unemployment in Spain for instance is that young is the number of young people who left training left schooling to try to make money in the market when, say, the property market was booming and other kinds of markets were booming. Is this a failure of the education system? Should the schooling system have prepared them better? Were they learning the wrong things at universities or at schools? And, and is this a failure of, of the education system? Uh, I don't see it as a failure of the education system, although I think all of our education systems can be better at that skills match and that package of skills that young people need coming out of whatever economic and social setting. Uh, but I don't think you can blame the schools for uh, a drop in the market and, uh, and, and what is now staggering unemployment in Spain. Uh, the schools couldn't have handled that, that issue, I don't think. Okay, so this rearranging and the... And people left oh, school for a job. That no. means they had a job. Right. And they, they were leaving for a good reason, in, in their view. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, too, I think we as parents even, uh, we, we want our kids to go to school and get as much schooling as they can, but we think of it unless they're born with trust funds and silver spoons in their mouths, that, that you've got you've to have a job. Right. Sustainable development for a human being is a job right. that you can get and keep, or a business that you can start and succeed at. And I think as parents, we want that, too. So the schooling, you do enough of it mm -hmm. other than the intellectual side to, to get a job. So if someone has left school to get a job, maybe they were making the right decision for that moment in time in their life and in the life of that economy that would, at, at one point Spain was booming. Yeah. And it's a great yeah. success story over the last 30 years. Right. No, I agree. I think that in, in, if anything, you could say that the system worked too well and yeah. too efficiently and information flowed very quickly mm -hmm. and adjusted very quickly and people were able to adjust their their career plans. Spain was a developing country 40 years ago right. and now it's it's been one of the great success right. stories of the last 30 years right. and it's too bad what's happening now because it's staggering the numbers. Yeah. But it does beg the question though why somebody would react so quickly to short-term changes and short-term information and I think there is something that maybe you, you talked about the role of parents and, and maybe that's important that that among the responsibilities of parents is to make sure that young people don't respond too quickly to short-term changes and short-term uh, information, that they yeah. think a little bit more about the long term and about building sustainable human capital. Well, I, th I think that's right. And I, I would imagine, too, that there weren't tons of college or high school kids dropping out of good schooling just to take a quickie job. Uh, but I think schools at all levels could, and it maybe is in the package of life skills, be aware and conscious of the whole resiliency factor. How do you teach young people? And I don't know that you teach it, but how do they learn it? And there's a difference between teaching and learning. Uh, but how, how do we equip young people, or they equip themselves with the resiliency to handle problems that we're all going to have sooner or later? And a problem could be just a fight on the job with your boss, and you're not fired yet, but you've got to figure it out. A pro another problem could be losing your job. 
And now how do you get the wherewithal, the, the spirit, the, the get up and go to dust yourself off and go out and find a new one? And it, resiliency, a lot of people talk about it in a variety of different places. And I, I, you don't teach it like you teach sixth grade math, but I think we've got to figure out ways of inculcating it into our life skills yeah. and, and education I, systems, formal and informal. I think that's a great point. I think that's really very important. Okay. Uh, something about the, the actual work that we both do. Uh, best practice. So uh, let's see. What is international best practice to, to resolve the problems of youth unemployment and, and to remove the barriers facing young people? What are the, what are the best things that, uh, that uh, the IYF does that you, you, in your experience to, to alleviate the constraints facing young people? Well, first, what are the obstacles to finding, unempl finding employment and, and what are the best ways to try to alleviate and remove those constraints? Well, let me draw you into the conversation too, yeah. Matthias. Yeah. But uh, you know, the bank put out five years ago a tremendous world development report that I mentioned earlier, and the chapter on employment is very interesting or work because it does say that we don't know enough about best practice. We probably know a fair amount about we, meaning the development community, public, private, multilateral, like the bank. We know a heck of a lot about keeping people healthy and a fair amount about keeping people in school through elementary and high school. Do we know as much as a development community about how young people get jobs, keep them? How do we structure society, schools, and, and these so-called public-private partnerships such that we know what is a good practice in employment and entrepreneurship versus a well-intentioned one? Mm. Or maybe one that we don't even know whether it's good or bad because we don't have any data and haven't done any uh, comparative studies. So to me, one of the strengths of of your bank, your bank, and the World Bank, Matthias, is that you've invested a lot in trying to learn more. Uh, and we together created a, a global partnership for youth employment with an Italian, an Arab, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, and, and the ILO, and our foundation in the bank to learn more about what are best practices. And I think what some of the things we've learned is that you have to have that dual client uh, it can't just be uh, demand uh, supply driven because you got a lot of young people who need jobs. It has to be demand driven. What does that community and, 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 and country need today and, and in the foreseeable future, not necessarily 20, 30 years out? Uh, how do you structure uh, the academic part, but how do you structure uh, a hands-on learning experience so that people are really learning skills? Uh, what, what's the dosage of hours? If it's a second chance or vocational program versus a purely academic, how much is practical? How much is academic? How much is hard skills and soft skills? Uh, how about some real live working experiences like internships or apprenticeships? Uh, how do you get that business community involved early on and not later uh, to telling the trainers and the governments whether they're public or private or nonprofit and, and oftentimes it's all three together but how do you structure the training so that it really is meeting local business needs how do you get the, the businesses to buy in mm. and help you do that some of that training well pretty good if you look like you're being receptive to them and what they may need coming down the pike so none of these are are so difficult to, to imagine, but it's the package, I mm. think, of those things that make a good program a better program or a better practice or, or an effective proven practice. I, I agree. I think the, the evidence that we've been able to accumulate so far is that uh, these programs don't always work. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones that seem to work better are the ones that are a little more comprehensive, that deal with the local demand as well as providing skills, that understand what the specific skills are needed. Yeah. not just the how to turn the screwdriver, mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. the how to show up for work on time skills, that provide maybe mentoring and guidance as well, uh, yeah. that provide practical work experience yeah. in apprenticeships or internships, but and, and jobs matching as well, uh, together uh, joining yeah. the private and public sectors. But, but these comprehensive programs are really expensive in general, right? So it's, it's much easier to have one targeted intervention, but it's also difficult to identify what that one targeted intervention that will be successful uh, could be. The comprehensive programs seem to work much better. Uh, I think so. Uh, is Harvard failing if not 100% of its graduates have jobs in the first six months after they leave Cambridge? Uh, I, I think we have to look at what is failure and what is success carefully. Uh, but I will tell you, we ran uh, 
a job training program for out of school, out of work, low income Latin Americans. And there was a, a good dose of IT training, but it wasn't to make them webmasters or mm. high tech folks. It was to actually say, these are young people, whether they work in the in a factory, in the back office of a service establishment, but if they're going to work in the 21st century, they need to know something about computers. And let me just say, you know, a 15-year-old is going to work until 2060 if he or she is lucky to have a job their whole life. And so we need to be thinking of the long term. Yeah, yeah that's really important. Uh, that actually uh, raises another question. I'm sorry. Oh, we can, shall we move to the, all right. I've just been given the instruction that we should move to some of the live questions that are coming in. And let me just read this out for you, if you don't mind. Youth unemployment is not only because of skills and education issues, but also because of perceptions. How can policymakers address these less tangible issues when addressing youth unemployment agenda? And this comes from Anush in Sri Lanka. And I think we've, we've already talked a little bit about this, uh, that, that parents are important, involving parents in, uh, in the decisions of children, of young people. And, uh, and getting, people, getting young people to have a sense of the future and a sense of themselves in the future, right? Uh, that it's worth staying in school an extra year to get the degree. It's worth staying in school to get the extra training or to, to make or, the investment. Or, or is it? Well, that's because a Because if question. you're in a, living in a stagnant economy where you're a, a poor kid growing up and your mother and father have never had a real job in the real economy, they've, they've had a self-employment or some sort of hit and miss or episodic a work experience where they bring home some income but it doesn't come with benefits and a real job and longevity and tenure or anything like that uh, why would you stay in school yeah. if you if you are really quite poor and schooling might become a bad opportunity cost so I think there the perception needs to be though that if you do stay in school and work hard and you can get these signals from whatever they're coming from uh, that the economy will will open up and will you know, if you get that kind of education and, and, and then build in those life skills and that kind of resiliency, you'll have a better chance. But you, you have to have some hope. Yeah. You really but do. You also raise a really important point that we haven't uh, addressed uh, explicitly, and that is the constraints facing young people may differ or will differ in different situations. So what the problems facing a 15-year-old in some rural part of uh, Mali uh, or wherever in a, in a poorer country are going to be very, very different from those facing a university graduate in Buenos Aires. Absolutely. Right, and the constraints yeah. are going to be different, and the solutions are going to be different, and we need to may pay attention to both of yeah. those. And in some economies, uh, there never may there may never be enough jobs in the formal economy to absorb that that bulge that you're talking about—the million a year coming into the African yeah. uh, marketplace looking for jobs. What if there are only 750,000 jobs? Right. Then are there 250,000 self-employment opportunities or business startups that are not really formal yeah. businesses yet and may never be, but where a young person through self-employment and hard work can earn an income? And we've got to prepare young people to do that. That's very, very important. Yeah. Okay, another question from Syed in, in Pakistan. What roles can chambers of commerce play in strengthening the industry-academia linkage? Well, good chambers, and there are strong and not so strong ones around the world, um, and there are some that are more progressive and thoughtful than, than others, uh, but good chambers have a real role to play because if you're trying to engage that business community in a dialogue with the public sector and academia, whether that's academia, public or private, uh, they need to be talking to each other. Uh, and oftentimes, frankly, they don't talk that well to each other or or just don't travel in the same circles or some universities or vocational schools are training people for the jobs that were there 20 right, years ago right. and the laboratory was set up for the workshop was set up for and that's not where the jobs are today right, right. chambers of commerce in my experience also are are, are good links with the policy world they, mm -hmm. they come they manage to bridge the the divide between the policy world and the, and the private sector. And I think we should expect that of them and force them to be that way somewhat by, by expecting it. Because if a uh, chamber is only a special interest group of businesses, it's narrower. But if it can, I think it can be more powerful to its members if it has those links to the policy makers and is looked at as a respectable interlocutor, if you will, with the public and private sectors. Yeah. Okay. All right, let me go back here. Um, we have a couple of questions on uh, sort of a little bit of what we talked about before about success. How do we measure success and effectiveness of youth employment initiatives? How do we understand whether or not something works? And I'm, I'm happy to take that too because this is something that you and I both work on. Well, take the first okay. back then. <laughs> all right, all right, thanks. 
Uh, we, uh, it's very important to us that we learn rigorously, that we learn really carefully and rigorously uh, whether or not something works and for whom and in what circumstances mm -hmm. and so on. And so together we've been doing quite a bit of work on this and, uh, and also the World Bank with other partners and through the Global Partnership for Youth Employment. We have many, many different kinds of experiments going on, pilot projects where we have control groups and they're very sophisticated experimental designs trying to understand what works on, on the small scale. And what we're trying to do is to learn a little bit, not just on the small scale, because we're, we're pretty good at that, but also at scale. How do, we, how do we go to scale? What happens to a program when it goes to scale? Because we can, we can design programs that work pretty well for a thousand young people. But considering the million that enter the labor force in Africa or the hundreds of millions who are unemployed, that's not terribly yeah. impressive, right? So the, the real problem we need to, the real thing we need to try to tackle is, is how do we succeed at scale? And that we haven't been very good at. We've been pretty good at learning what works in the small, but yeah. not so good about the, and the big some, scale. And to some, a thousand people coming through a training program might be scale. That's true. Uh, that's and that's, that, that yeah. shows the problem is even bigger. But uh, scale is, I think, has to be our, our, our gold standard, Matthias. Otherwise, we're diddling around. Uh, a youth bulge or any other global challenge like this, it could be a health challenge or an environmental challenge, if we're not looking at how to scale up better practice programs or proven practice programs, we're, I don't think we're doing our jobs as development people, whether we're the World Bank or a corporate social responsibility program or an NGO or the government. Mm. And this is why I think public-private partnerships are so important. They're not just a flavor of the month that people want to do because it seems new. Sustainability means governments sticking with things from one administration to another when, it, when it's working. And that takes the citizenry holding the, account, the, the government accountable. Uh, we, we've, we've run a program in the Philippines with the Ministry of Education for 10 years now around distance learning and, and, and using technology, and I won't get into the details of that. But to me, sustainability there is that we're working with our seventh Minister of Education, and they haven't changed the pro the the, the program, wow. or they haven't canceled it because they want to start the world afresh because a new minister has arrived. Uh, when you've got the business community involved because it really is serving their needs, their job needs, yeah. then you've got probably the, the, the components of scale and sustainability also. So scale and sustainability to me go hand in hand. You can't have scale without sustainability. Right. And sustainability for minor little things is, is still, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, we're almost out of time. So the last question here. Uh, which comes uh, from two people, from one from the U.S. And, and I've lost the other one, I apologize. In any event, for a young person who is concerned about uh, unemployment among his or her peers and, and thinking about long, the long term, what can a young person do now to, uh, to try to alleviate the problems of, of unemployment facing her peers or his peers? Oh, well, uh, one is probably staying in school and trying to work hard and do well. Uh, but it's also, I think, being attuned to um, your community and what would you like to do and is what you like to do maybe and what moves you and the passion and all. And we all want that of our kids. Pursue your passions, but is that passion an employable passion or, or maybe not? What's it going to take? Some self-awareness, too, that it's not all about academic. It is mm -hmm. about you know, getting along with people, being a problem solver, being uh, out maybe a little bit more outgoing around certain things, uh, uh, not uh, feeling like you're a failure because you took one interview and it didn't, you didn't get the job, uh, live in the real world, uh, have a sense of hope. Now, some of those things are a little intangible, but I think they're, at the end of the day, for a young person, uh, terribly important. Okay. All right, I think that's all the time we have. So thank you very much to everyone who was watching and listening and uh, typing and uh, for watching online and providing us with these provocative questions. And thank you very much, Bill, for taking part in this. Well, this is fun, Matthias. Right. Thank okay. you. Thanks.